obviously the the talk is is in relation to climate change which is an absolutely huge issue um, and I could have done a talk about global ch climate change and I could have done a talk about what we're doing in Birmingham to sort of rectify climate change or whatever or what other cities are doing but actually you can read all that stuff in the press and there's no shortage of information to look up in terms of what good looks like or what we should be doing and the research I've been doing at the university and in fact I've been at the university I'm in a very fortunate position in that uh, you might not agree I, um, I've worked for Birmingham City Council for 43 years um, and I've lived in Charlton Kings for over 25 but um, since the year 2000 I've basically had this split role of being one foot in the city and the other foot in the university and the idea is that your research informs city decision making and the challenges that the city face are put to the university to see if we can jointly fix them and I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I think it should be a compulsory position for all towns and cities because it's the way to sort of help join the dots um, and it does seem ludicrous that the two things aren't connected so I've been very lucky in that regard um, but what the research has, has, has taken me to is a, a sort of fresh understanding of and the major concern I've got is so we know all the facts we know a lot of the fixes so why isn't it happening and, and that's the bit that I wanted to try and focus on this evening. So, um, I've already said these are the three headings that um, CK Futures runs with. Um, what I'm also wanting to introduce is a fourth circle. Um, it's a sign of complete madness to be able to draw a circle. I'd already done it, <laughs> I'd already done it before in pencil. <laughs> Um, the, the fourth circle I wanted to introduce, um, I would give it the title of justice. You might not all be able to see that. But how that actually plays out in uh, a community or a locality is, is much more to do with health and well-being because when you actually tap it down into what is it we want we want um, a sort of healthy place and a healthy lifestyle and in fact there's a brilliant book if you haven't read it already called happy city um, quite a recent book uh, which is trying to look at the health and well-being ingredients that are that are needed for um, a healthy city um, but Justice, for me, ties these things together. What's, what I wanted to focus on, though, is that we've just seen, you can't have not seen, we have a new cabinet this, <laughs> this week, and there will be a position for climate change. The chances are that one person is also responsible for a whole string of other things. And this is the way in which we're approaching it, um, is still seeing it as a silo operation. What, what we get from the um, news bulletins and manifestos and many other parts is that people say what they're doing for climate but instinctively we feel that it's an inadequate response and it's only a partial response in terms of um, what's required and and the main reason for that is that the key focus is on something called scope one emissions which is 
what you as an organization or a place or a country emit. And that is the number one thing we need to be focusing on to get those emissions down. So it makes total logical sense. But it inevitably means, in my book, that you're only dealing with a small fraction of the picture. Now, what I find interesting is why is it that we're able to sort of intuit that? And that comes to this other little piece uh, here, which is actually something that you may know the person, Simon Sinek, has written a whole book on this, Start With The Why. And he's a sort of business guru. Um, but I find it totally fascinating that um, it's also about the way in which we've evolved as human beings. So if you take this as a slice through the human brain, and I know that there's at least one retired medic in the audience, so <laughs> forgive me, this doesn't stand up to Lancet standards, but in essence, your brain has got these three sort of parts. Right at the center is something known as the limbic brain, which is right at the heart of your uh, brain organ. And it's also evolutionary what we had when we evolved from apes into humanoids, that's what, we, that's what we had. And the essential function of that part of the brain, which is still there, drives all our emotions, all our decision making, and has no power for language. And that is how we make decisions. What it's surrounded by is the inner cortex, which is basically to do with um, analysis, would be the best word to use. So we work things out, which is why it equates to the how. And right on the outside is actually the outer cortex, which is the power of language. It's the last thing that, as human beings, we were able to develop and master, and it's what's made us distinctly different from the others. So what's that got to do with climate change? It's got to do with a lot in terms of coming back to that whole question of decision making. The way in which we have operated and the way in which we think and the way in which we try and push a decision over the line is that we get loads and loads of information together and we try and persuade people to actually change their minds through facts and information. And it's also how a lot of companies operate um, in terms of they're very good at what they're doing and in fact it's the way in which whole sorts of government, local government, it's all these systems that we've currently got work from the outside in. What's going to be really important, what is important in relation to climate change and the response to climate change is to do it from the inside out and actually start with that question of why. Because until we get to the basic understanding of what is the question of why that we're trying to fix, then we're stuck out here trying to wrestle with more facts and more how-to-dos. So let me just try and explain that. This is a lovely quote which I really like. It's from uh, Alberto Velodo, who is a Cuban anthropologist and social scientist. In that uh, he studies people all over the, all over the planet, um, he's, he's heavily involved in um, ethnography and indigenous people as well. There are those who follow maps and those who make them. And I think we're at a point in time where we absolutely need to make a map. 
And the problem is we're waiting for somebody to give us a map because of the way that we've actually thought about most problem solving that we've done. We think someone is going to come up with a map to actually tell us how to solve this. And we absolutely have to make it ourselves. When I was mentioning that why earlier, it's really interesting to me in terms of who can see that that picture that we're being presented is only a partial picture. We're being sold a partial picture in terms of the solution. And this generation can actually see it. They instinctively know this is only a partial picture. And what they want is a, is a much more joined up holistic response. And the interesting thing is that to me, is that I've been at Birmingham a long time. I've had that sustainability or climate change in my job title since the year 2000. And yet, Birmingham City Council only declared a climate emergency in 2019. Why? Why? Because these guys were battering the doors every Friday afternoon saying, why aren't you doing it? The facts hadn't changed, the information hadn't changed, but the councillors and those in charge felt compelled to respond to the climate strikers. The other issue, and obviously what's important about what it is I'm trying to say this evening, is about this whole thing of what's hidden or what's invisible in all this sort of myriad of statistics and um, the way we're sort of blinded by information. Here's a very simple chart. It's not difficult to understand that basically the 70% of the emissions are coming from 10 basic countries or places. The IPCC report, um, which declared that obviously we need to hold ourselves to 1.5, and that's what the Paris Climate Accord set, um, is to try and wrestle with that whole issue. But what I'm interested in is what's the sort of invisible bit of all those um, statistics? Because it's very clear that that is uh, a major, that is the cause of the, the problem. But when you actually drill into it, cities and city living is what's generating all these emissions. 80% of the emissions are being generated from cities, city living, 75% of natural resources. So it's not these sorts of uh, blocks of territory that are producing emissions, it's lifestyle. And it's lifestyle that we're all leading right now, sat here in Charlton Kings, um, in that what we are living is a city lifestyle. So the, the key to unlocking this is to really, really start to drill into how can we think about city lifestyle differently? How can we do something different about that city lifestyle? One of the things uh, that I was involved with uh, in, in research terms was a, um, a five-year study called Livable Cities, which was again trying to look at what are the ingredients that actually make a sustainable city. And it was a pan-national study, and in fact, pan-global study in the end, um, trying to look at uh, what are the key ingredients uh, that are needed? And critically asking that question of why isn't it happening? Um, I'll just shift that because that seems to be casting a bit of a shadow. Um, and there were three sort of concluding things in terms of why aren't those cities, why aren't cities around the world actually operating in that sort of sustainable way? And there's been a disconnect um, between municipal governance, finance, 
and planning. And those three things, which are three core functions of a place, have become independent of each other and not connected to each other. So you're not getting this joined up approach. What you're getting is these sort of siloed approaches. And the amazing thing is that's a global problem. The United Nations produced a whole uh, catalogue of how to make a sustainable city called the New Urban Agenda. And its key conclusions were that those three things had to be in lockstep in order to make it work. But what's really interesting is that having said that the core driver behind those national statistics are cities, if you recall, in 2009, we were at COP15. Next week, or the week after, we've got COP27. And the critical thing about 2009 and Copenhagen was the fact that the whole world was expecting an agreement, just in the way it happened in Paris in 2015. And the reason it didn't happen in 2009 is that we were just having a financial meltdown, a global financial crisis. And all the politicians said, whoa, we're not, we're not signing anything. And their lobbyists were saying, don't go anywhere near this. The finance markets were not in any position to agree to any global uh, agreements. And that's very significant, because what happened between 2009 and 2015 is the global finance markets got their act together and completely changed their perspective on climate change, which is why the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement was signed by 194 countries. You might think it's political, it is political, but it needs that join up. What happened in Copenhagen, which is fascinating, is that the whole agenda was kind of trashed and the press went crazy about it being a complete failure. All the mayors of all the cities who were there formed their own subgroup and said, why don't we just do it for ourselves? Why are we waiting for national agreements? Why don't we just sort it. We're big enough, we've got enough clout, we can just actually work this all out ourselves. And what followed were a whole series of international city networks that came out of that. Looking at a whole range of issues and have continued to work as networks since. Biophilic Cities is just one of those networks. So if cities are essentially the issue, and we've got this race against time, um, this is just an interesting sort of global spread. Uh, McKinsey, who are the um, uh, sort of global institute for um, economic projections and um, business analysis, have done this piece of work saying that effectively the 21st century, which we're in now, it's not going to be about nation states in terms of generating wealth or uh, the most important uh, players. It's actually going to be key cities. They've mapped where they are. The dark blues are already existing and the light blues are yet to, yet to happen. And basically that will be what uh, drives uh, that sort of set in train and it's going to drive what happens. Now, the scary part is that we also took part in some national research about the speed of that change that's happening across the world. And if you take Birmingham as a city of circa one million people, it's actually more than that now, but then what you're looking at is a size of the city of Birmingham every week is effectively statistically popping up around the world. That, that is the speed of urbanization. So if that follows the same path as all other cities, then we're in serious trouble. And that's why it needs to follow a very, very different path. Now, what also happened at that 2009 climate crisis is that 
uh, a lot of investors withdrew money from the markets because they saw them as being very unstable and huge worries about where it was going. They withdrew them to the tune of $21 trillion. And what that money wants to invest in is a sustainable future. It's actually trying to invest in rectifying the problem. So when people say to you there's no money for this, money is not the issue. So I've mentioned a few things there in relation to climate change and how that relates to city and city living. The other part of that whole equation over here is we've got the word environment in the title of the, uh, the group, um, CK Futures. We've got connecting people, the environment, and climate. And just for the purposes of tonight's talk, <laughs> I want you to think of that as nature rather than the environment. And there's a key reason for that, in that these things are completely and utterly interlocked. So in terms of our understanding of nature and how it plays into this whole equation, and also trying to understand why is it that we've seen the crash that we've seen in global populations and habitats, this study really changed the way in which we viewed nature. In the year 2000, um, the UN commissioned a Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. It's a way of actually looking at nature and saying, what does it do for us in terms of benefits? Up until that point, we'd always viewed nature as um, something that was a given, something that was incalculably valuable and that we should just accept and live with and treasure. But we weren't doing. We were sacrificing it at a heck of a rate. And th one of the things that the scientists wanted to understand, these were social scientists as well as um, other scientists, is can we actually work out what all those benefits are that nature gives us? And if you want it in simple terms, there's an excellent book by Tony Juniper that's titled, What Has Nature Ever Done For Us? And it's brilliant in terms of all the examples. So this was a scientific analysis that then started to say, nature offers a whole range of benefits and they're measurable. They're quantifiable and they're measurable. And that gave rise to a, a new understanding of how you could combine that with economics. In a sense, you'd call it natural capital. But that is not the same as putting a price on it. You do not want it to be a commodity that you sell. You want it to be a value that you protect. The UK was the first country in the world to apply that science to the whole of the UK and map it in terms of, so what's the condition of the UK? And I was lucky enough to be working with this team who came through with this graph. And this graph is what changed the minds of government. Up until then, government were happy to keep nature as something that they would just measure and think about. When this graph was shown to them, it hit the Y button. And they suddenly realized that actually, it's something you can't live without. It's absolutely fundamental to everyone's existence. And that a primary exercise should be to restore what we've, le what we've lost. But before you can actually get to a point of restoring what you've lost, it's really important to understand what didn't we do before? How come it fell through the floor in terms of 
not noticing or not bringing it to everyone's attention. And historically, we were not measuring the benefits of nature. We were measuring the so many square meters or acres, the numbers of birds, the numbers of butterflies, but we were not joining the dots and saying, so what is the human benefit of all that natural environment? Ecosystem science has allowed us to do that. Now the critical difference is that we're pretty much here at this decision point. The current trajectory is still on the red line. So the government introduced their 25 year environment plan directly as a result of this work. That is what it's stipulating. Now it means a complete change of the way in which we do business. And the only way we're gonna be able to do that is totally move away from this siloed view of how it actually works at the moment. And the critical part about this graph, which I really want you to understand, is that these dotted lines are the projection broken into five-year chunks. And what's really important to notice is that each five years, the ambition and what you have to achieve jumps. It's not a straight line. It jumps, and it jumps more. Because you have to accelerate what we're doing. Now, the way in which that's drawn is exactly the same, if you will, in terms of how we need to tackle the climate crisis as well. And what these shaded areas represent are the resources that is going to be needed to actually get you up that graph. Now, that's not about new resources. That's about capacity building of making it everybody's business instead of having it as a siloed subject. That actually, you've got to be able to show that if those benefits are critical to our human lifestyle and our human existence, how do we start to measure them in what we do? so that the resource is no longer an environment team, but it's everybody. And the same is true for climate. So I have here a little book. <laughs> if anyone wants one, it's not the lit fest, I'm not selling them. <laughs> but we were the first city in the world to map that same exercise in terms of, so how dependent are we on the nature in Birmingham? And how far short are we of how, how much we actually need? And in order to make those understandable, we published a map. And we had interest from all over the world. Because what that actually shows, and the reason I wanted it shaded in red is that the deeper the red, the more we're failing, the more we're in that really, really dodgy area of the graph. Because only in these white areas and paler areas is nature able to give us all those benefits and for the people to be able to receive those benefits. In the other areas, the people aren't able to access that nature to, in order to get the benefits. So we've looked at climate, we've looked at nature in terms of understanding cities. One of those other words we wrote down here, which was justice. And as I say, as it plays out at a local scale, it's much more in relation to health and well-being. So in this context, what do I mean by justice? In this context, what I'm really referring to is, for example, what the government talk about in terms of levelling up. Every city in the country, every town in the country, has to assess how it fares on this index of multiple deprivation. It's a standard set, sent from government for every city, so it's an, an equal benchmarking exercise. What it contains are a series of domains that you do survey work against. 
what we've currently got here under living environment measures quality of housing, air quality and road traffic accidents. And so when COVID-19 happened, what suddenly became obvious to everyone, not just in the UK, but all over the world, is that actually people didn't have access to green space, depending on where they lived. And there was an inequality about that. And that same inequality chimed with their life expectancy and many other factors. So we thought, well, let's see if we can create a map of Birmingham that looks at these factors under something called environmental justice. Now, Berlin did this in 2014. Many US cities have followed suit, but there's no UK city that's done it until now. The other agenda that the um, government are searching for is climate. Nowhere in here are there any climate measures. So suddenly you're looking at how you can level up an area, but your measures don't contain anything about nature, anything really about health and well-being, anything about flood risk or urban heat island or what climate is going to do. So not forward looking, but you're, what you're wanting to do is level them up. So for us, that seems a bit wrong headed. So we've looked at data sets that are available nationally and we've created an environmental justice map for the city and again colored it in such a way across all the wards which shows this gradation of where you live, um, uh, the opportunities in the future are very different and as a city it gives you a really strong framework to say how you should prioritize in terms of what needs fixing first. And in order to do that, we asked for a governance change. If you remember back to that earlier slide that talked about governance, finance, and planning being important. So what we've set up is a city of nature board, a steering group that looks completely across the organization where we've mapped all those connections. And at a delivery level, when you come to do something on the ground, you've got mixed teams doing lots of different things within which is restoring nature as part of that process. And so we think it's a, a much more sort of integrated approach. What sits alongside that is that we've, because of the strategic focus, we've brought all our third sector organizations together to form a community partnership alliance. They've always worked with us, but they've always worked with us independently on a one-off project basis here, there, and everywhere. Now they're in a single alliance where they can act as a strategic group, <coughs> access additional funding, but also bring that community voice, community presence, and land things on the ground in a different way. So that's how we've sort of um, tackled some issues in relation to justice, and I'll come back to that right at the end. If I can just move on to that fourth wheel, which is the people, one of the key things in relation to people's engagement and contribution to all this is around vision. Because if people haven't got a sense that there's a vision or that there's something to buy into, then they withdraw. But if you offer them some sort of vision and even better engage them in making that vision, then their engagement is much more successful. And this was the thing that attracted us to joining the Biophilic Cities Movement where you've got cities all over the world, and basically the, the strap line that I like is putting nature at the heart of decision making. That's what they are actually signed up to doing. And we've learned an awful lot from this network and are still learning from them. And anywhere can join. So, what we've also done is here is an image which you might think is from Singapore, but actually it's Victoria Square. And we had a, um, an amazing sort of greening of Victoria Square uh, by this company, Pollinator, who did as a sort of closing ceremony for the Commonwealth Games um, just a month or so ago. 
uh, in the centre of town. And it brought into people's minds that actually this could be different. This could be different. It doesn't just have to be grey. It could be different. What sat alongside it here, which I appreciate you won't be able to read from the room, is a complex wheel approach of how Singapore handles all its public housing. <coughs> and it puts nature at the heart of all its public housing and steps through all these mechanisms. Now, obviously, Singapore is a single unit, top-down state, very different to here. But what they did was spent five years working with all their contractors, all the parts of the organization, all their partners and everyone else to set up a supply chain and a way in which they knew they could guarantee to make this work. And all their public housing is now meeting this sort of standard. So it's inspiration in terms of what's available. Another city from the Biophilix group is Toronto. And in conversations with Toronto, they were again one of these cities who were saying, we can't wait for the national government to sort this because Canada's not a long way ahead of where we are or anywhere else. And so what they introduced was this new green standard into Toronto. And what it is, is a tiered <coughs> options, like a menu that you offer to developers uh, coming into your city. So tier one is just to meet your absolute government uh, legal requirements. It's business as usual, done as well as you can, but it's business as usual. So that's the bit that's compulsory. Above that, they have introduced tiers two to four, which are voluntary codes, which stipulate climate neutrality, energy generation, not just energy neutral, and a whole load of other massive step-ups and in relation to nature. So they have codified what each of those tiers represent. What's interesting is they started to introduce this in 2014 and it's now operational fully from 2018. Whoops, I've gone backwards. What they say to us now is everyone is knocking on their door saying they want to do tier four. No one's telling them to do tier four. But do you remember I mentioned that money? What the finance markets are looking for is climate secured investment that will give them a return for 25 to 30 years. And one of the best ways of doing that is through cities. And what they measure are just not the returns on investment but health and well-being, the nature restoration, social value, and your climate. What they're after is something that ticks all those boxes. So we thought, well, there's an idea. So this next week, <laughs> my task is to convert the information we've got here, and we've been working at the uh, university, and we've now got the data that can transform this map into a climate risk and vulnerability assessment map, which basically means every sub-zone of Birmingham, you will know how it performs now and in X years' time in relation to what the climate risks are and that whole integration with nature and your well-being measures and uh, how it works from an environmental justice point of view. So you can start to take much more informed decisions about what should happen in each part of your city. And we're looking at sorting out the two to four tiers for Birmingham in terms of what would that look like. And I've got to present it with other people at the end of November to the corporate leadership team. So that we could start to advertise and promote that yes, we've got business as usual, but actually we want you to go much further. And if you will, what these codes are really talking about is this is 2030, this is 2035, this is 2041, 
and this is 2050. If we do business as usual, we're talking about net zero in 2050. We can't wait for that. We have to facilitate much more accelerated change. And we have to be able to tell people what that looks like and make it a vision that the local people want to engage with and set it up in a way that they want to engage with. So what has to sit alongside that, that's all your technical information, is how do you bring the community into that equation? So what every town and city again in the country has to have is a health and wellbeing board. It's a compulsory part and that's how all those GP surgeries, hospitals, everything else integrate. What we're looking to set up is a climate and nature board that would actually have exactly the same statutory sort of a, a, a function, but it carries that title of 2030. Because what it's going to start doing is saying to everybody, how is that decision getting us anywhere near 2030? Have you reviewed what your options are to actually get us there much more quickly? Really drive that challenge throughout the whole organization and across all four of these pillars in relation to what we're doing with people, health and well-being, climate and nature, so that you're not just looking at one aspect. And what would sit alongside that is a citizens group, a citizens assembly to be an independent demanding voice that you would then counsel and work with and they would have their own integrated sort of delivery model that would sit alongside what the council is trying to do internally as well. And that that isn't just citizens because that would also involve business. So you're setting up a, a systems way of actually operationalizing those types of steps that you could get to do. Now there's a lot of detail to fill in on all those boxes, but actually that gives you a real mechanism to say we can step up to this. And the reason why it's really interesting to me that when we start presenting this to the corporate leadership team, they're saying yes. They're saying yes to it because what they're aware of is this mood change in that what people are wanting is, come on, do it. Let's not wait for government. Let's not wait for government because it isn't going to happen. And that's an international issue. That's not a criticism of our own government per se. It's an international issue. So the reason for talking about, about all that here is that a lot of these ideas are completely transferable and scalable. They're not something that's just the concern of a big city. It should be something that could happen at any scale. It could happen here at Charlton Kings or Cheltenham in terms of taking a different approach. I'm going to say one critical thing. I'll probably get shot for it, but I unfortunately missed Max Wilkinson's talk when he came to talk about the climate plan because I got the time wrong. So as I stepped through the door, it was 7.30, not 7, and all I saw was any questions. <laughs> so I totally missed the talk, but I did ask a question. I shouldn't have been <coughs> able to ask a question, but I did ask a question, and I was a bit shocked at his response because what he said, we've got four people. And to me, that's looking at it from the wrong end of the lens. You haven't got four people at, at Cheltenham. You've got however many people you employ, how many people are in your supply chains, how many people are in the city. You can't say you've got four people. It's, <laughs> it's totally the wrong response. So um, I've... I've rattled through a few things there and I'm hoping that some of it registered. Those at the front, did you get your stones back? Oh no, <laughs> I'm in serious trouble now, I've got two holes. So what those stones were, thanks Mary, <laughs> what those stones were, you'll know, um, living here, and I just like it as a story, is that what this is, is Cotswold stone, it's, it's oolitic limestone. And what those little rough pieces are, are oolits. Now, I very nearly did geology at, at university. That's why I moved to Birmingham. And I never took it up. I did other things. 
But what's fascinating is, I was told, well, uh, what sits at the centre of there is a grain of sand. And in chalky seas, 140 million years ago, they washed backwards and forwards. And as they did, they just got wrapped in more and more chalk and limestone. And so what you've got are layers and layers of limestone. Because that's the best we could see when I was at school. <laughs> now, the National University of Australia, Dan Ander, has done cross-sections through these because they've got the same sort of stone, which again is quite interesting, that at one point we were somewhere close. Um, and what sits at the heart of them is a single-celled organism. And they're called a coccolithophore. <laughs> we can have a competition at the end to see who can spell it. <laughs> and the more interesting thing is, they exist today. And they existed in huge quantities, because enough to build all the building stone of Cotswolds. They exist in huge quantities today. They're in the surface of every ocean. And they're single cell organisms. And as such, they photosynthesize. They're alive, they photosynthesize. They capture carbon dioxide and they make a shell around the outside, unchanged from 140 million years ago. And in accepting that carbon dioxide, they exist in such quantities, they are responsible for absorbing half the CO2 in the world. Because they photosynthesize, they also emit oxygen. If you remember your basic science, sugar's into oxygen. And so they emit oxygen and they emit 50% of the air we breathe. And when they die, because they're not long-lived, it's a sad tale, <laughs> they emit something called dimethyl ether, which is the same thing that they use to seed rain clouds over deserts. They are responsible for 50% of the rain we get in the world. And we've pretty much only just discovered them. What are we doing to our oceans? What are we measuring in our oceans? The oceans is kind of the last bastion of things that we haven't really properly taken charge of because there's no system. It just shows how dependent we are on nature. In it, totally immeasurable. And we have to lock these things into our decision making. So we need a totally different approach to the way in which we decide and think about how we do these things and bring them all together into a holistic reckoning. And I just really like the fact that I've discovered they do that at Charlton Keynes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>